Hey, Bernie. I am pulling that one resolution off, right? The, uh, the one you sent me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, okay. Yeah, you just pull that. The first, uh, the third one, I think it is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because I can already need to change it. So. Okay. We're good? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here. It is uh, 7 o'clock, so we like to try to start on time. Welcome to uh, the February 13th, 2023 meeting of the Mayor and Council of Princeton. We are streaming the, tonight's meeting as we usually do, although we do have some uh, complications with our ability to do Zoom tonight. So uh, I'm going to have to apologize to anybody that hoped they were going to join the meeting remotely and were not able to do that this evening. But having said that, we will move along. And could we have the uh, meeting notice, please? Meeting Adequate statement. notice of this meeting was provided in accordance with the requirements of the Open Public Meetings Act, including the time, date, and location of the meeting. In addition, the agenda and all related materials were posted electronically and made available to the public on Princeton's meeting portal in advance of the meeting. Thank you. And can we have the land acknowledgement? Yes. Thank you. We gather today on the land of the Leni Lenape. As members of the Princeton community, we aspire to show appreciation, respect, and concern for all peoples and our environment. We honor the Lenape and other indigenous caretakers of these lands and waters, the elders who lived here before, the indigenous today, and the generations to come. Thank you. Okay, can we have roll call, please? Ms. Perone Lambros? Here. Ms. Niedergang? Here. Mr. Cohen? Here. Ms. Sachs? Ms. Fraga? Here. Mr. Newland? Here. Mayor Frieda? Here. Could I ask everyone to stand with me and uh, recite the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, first up on the agenda, we have three sets of minutes, which if someone, thank you, Leticia, is going to move all three? Yes. Thank you very much. Is there a, a second? Thank you, Eve. Any questions or comments on any of the minutes? Okay, seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And just to uh, everybody else up here, since the screens aren't working, I do have to keep looking right and left to see who's raising hands or whatever. So that'll be a little, uh, I know it is upsetting, but um, so it is a little. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I know. So just give me a, a little bit of time for that. Uh, one thing on the agenda, the third item under resolutions, we will not be doing tonight. There's a an amendment we need to file with, uh, with HUD in order, in order for us to uh, take that up. So that'll be a few months probably by the time that gets through their process. So that's resolution 2370, which is the third item under resolutions, which we will not. Thank you, Josh. Number three under resolutions, resolution 2370, we will not be doing tonight. We have to file an amendment with HUD and get their approval before we can move that resolution. So that'll probably take a while. I don't know if anyone else had any other changes to the agenda. Okay. Um, Mayor, I'm sorry. When we come to the hearing, the ordinance hearing, we were going to discuss putting uh, the one ordinance off. Should we wait till we get to that? Okay. Uh, so Michelle is referring to uh, the public hearing, the second item under public hearing, ordinance public hearing, sorry, which is ordinance 2023-04. It's a possibility that will public hearing date will be extended. Okay, anything else? All right, announcements and reports. To make it easy for me, I'm gonna start on my left side. Anybody over here with announcements or reports? No, okay, terrific. On this side, anybody, Eve? No, go ahead. Uh, just a couple of things. A uh, reminder that the Environmental Commission will be having a presentation from the consultant and our open space manager about Princeton's new environmental resource inventory that is uh, 
on Zoom on February 22nd at 7 p.m. So uh, please join us for that. And uh, just also want to add that we, uh, the municipalities received permission from Fish and Wildlife to begin the 2023 community-based year management plan. This means that we should be able to continue to keep our deer motor vehicle accident numbers low and to protect species diversity and the understory in our forests and wooded spaces. We will try again next year, hopefully with greater success, to incorporate sterilization methods into our plan. And I wanted to thank our municipal attorney, Trishka Cecil, and our animal, animal control officer, Jim Ferry, for all the hard work that they've put into this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle? Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> a couple things. So for the Recreation Department, um, first of all, we had the kickoff meeting um, for the Community Park South Concept Design and Community Engagement Project. Uh, we held the, uh, the first steering committee uh, with our consultant suburban consulting engineers. Um, We'll meet again as a steering committee uh, with the consultant on March 21st, and I'd like to announce that the first public engagement meeting um, has been scheduled for March 30th, so mark your calendars. Um, it's a great, exciting process that we're beginning. I also want to mention that we're taking uh, applications to rec department for following summer jobs, day camp counselor, day camp supervisor, teen travel camp counselor, lifeguard swim instructor, uh, pool service and seasonal maintenance. Uh, applications can be found at, on the website. Uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, be involved in the community. And um, yeah, we, need, we need staff. So um, please tell, tell, your, tell your children, tell your neighbors. Um, and then lastly, I just want to mention, uh, this has come up quite often, you know, we have a lot of financial aid that's available for our Princeton residents for all of our recreation programs, and applications are available both in English and Spanish, um, and you can see them on, on the website. Um, I'd also like to mention that today we sent out, um, under the communications uh, committee, we sent out the first uh, a survey to all our newsletter subscribers. We're looking at how to redesign to better serve our community and increase our distribution. Uh, so just want to urge people who are subscribing to please uh, fill out the survey. And of course, if you're not subscribing, uh, to please go on the website and subscribe. Uh, the last thing I'd like to mention is just an announcement. I don't know how many of our residents are familiar with this. Uh, it kind of seems like it's flying under the radar scope, but the New Jersey Anchor Tax Relief Program, their deadline is in two weeks. It's February 28th, the end of this month. You can go to nj.gov website. This, you both homeowners and renters can receive benefits. Um, there's quite a few generous benefits if you have income that's less than 150,000 household income. Um, or um, even up to 250,000 for homeowners and renters um, up to 150,000. So um, if you haven't done so, you can still apply. That's it, thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, why don't we do the uh, police monthly report? Cap, there you are. I'm sorry? Yeah, we can do, well, we're, we're under the same thing, so we'll do the police report and then we'll do staff reports. Um, good evening. So I'm going to just um, point out some highlights from our um, December's uh, Chief's Monthly Report. Um, in December, the, the police department partnered with our Human Services Department, and we identified three families that um, needed some assistance during the holiday times. So we um, adopted these families and we were able to provide them with um, gifts for their families and gift cards to local grocery stores. Um, like I said, we did that for three families. It was a really good event, something that we um, look forward to doing every single year. And it, I have to say it helped. We had um, families donate um, presents and gift cards for us so that we were able to uh, give it to these families. Uh, the other thing that um, we participated in in um, December, and some of uh, mayor and council um, were involved in this, we um, participated in Women's Spaces Community of Lights event that they do every December, where it um, highlights some of the resources that victims of domestic violence and um, sexual assault um, 
can, and it gives them, um, just highlights some of the things that Women's Space does for the community. We participate that in every year, and uh, it's always a good event that we look forward to. So that's um, the highlights from the report. I'd just like to uh, point out a couple other things. Tonight on the agenda is a resolution for vehicles. Um, the police department wasn't able to purchase vehicles for the last couple years in 20 and 21 because of the way the um, ordering banks were. We worked with uh, Tim Veneta from the garage and also um, Sandy Webb. And so the resolution on there is um, money for cars. We're, you know, hopefully get that approved. And then we'll have the money for when the ordering banks do open. So we'll be able to purchase new cars to um, take care of our cars that are in disrepair or the ones that are older and are starting to get out of warranty. Another resolution on the agenda is for a new Alco test machine. That's the machine we use when we have to process individuals who are arrested for um, driving while intoxicated. The, um, our machines are probably over 10 years old now, and the state has come up with some new technology and new machines, so these are going to be phased out. Um, so we're um, going to be purchasing a new machine. And then finally, um, the police department is going to start using, um, just wanted to get it out to everybody before we did, it's called Frontline Solutions. It's a parking permissions platform. Traditionally, if someone is calling for parking permission, either overnight or if there's a you know, disabled vehicle or something, they call the police department and it ties up the resources of our dispatchers when they do that. So now this platform, people can go online, request permission online, and then they get granted and it, it eases some of the resources up at dispatch. And that platform is available in um, English and Spanish. So that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you, Captain. Any questions for Eve? Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here and mentioning the two resolutions because I did have a question about the new breathalyzer equipment. Does that, I'm sorry, it's very hard for us to see each other. Hi. <laughs> um, I assume that requires retraining of the police officers or is it just kind of very similar or do you have to retrain everyone to use the new equipment? So it is retraining, but if you're brand new to it, it's a it's a 40 hour course. And my understanding with this one, when you re, um, transfer to this one, it's um, just like a four or eight hour a day. It's not a full week of training. Wow, I didn't realize the training was that intensive. Yes. I assume they, I mean, I looked at the description of the equipment, it sounded very complicated. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thank you for being here and thanks for that report. Thank you. Any, David? Yeah, this is a little bit random, but um, looking through the parking enforcement statistics, uh, I noticed a pretty big jump in um, summonses for um, violation of the two-hour parking limit. Um, you know, it was 44 violations just this month compared to 27 in 2019 and 20 in 21. Um, I'm just curious whether there's some think different about the enforcement procedures or technology that might account for that, or is it just random? Yeah, there, there hasn't been a change um, in that. You know, when we get complaints about two-hour zones, we, we do enforce them more, but they are enforced regularly. I just think it's um, probably an anomaly. Okay. Leticia? Yes, thank you. So, let me, I'm sorry, let me just... Hey, Chris, yeah. you can face forward and don't okay. worry about turning around right. because when you turn around, the microphone might Understood. not pick up okay. what you're saying in the audience that's... Anyway, it, and so. mine is not so much of a... Uh, and that's not actually a question, but more of a statement of something that I've noticed in the reports over the years now that we get numbers, also data from 2019 and 2021 and 22. But something uh, that I've kept an eye on uh, is the, which I think follows a national trend, is the incidents involving emotionally disturbed persons. In 2019, there were six. In 2022, there were 25. And I've, I've seen a continued increase, which I'm assuming is related to COVID and other uh, issues that are, are especially our youth, but others also are facing with uh, mental well-being. And it's something that, that I think it just brings to our attention that perhaps we need to address and do more to help our re address the needs of our residents when it comes to their mental well-being. 
like I said, not a question, but more of an observation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the captain? Okay, great. Other staff reports. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The uh, engineering staff has a couple of little updates. First of all, after uh, several weeks of delay, that waste carts are finally being delivered. Um, <laughs> they started today Yay. and uh, should be delivered over the next few days to every resident <clears throat> in the town. I want to give you an update on the PSE&G gas modernization project. The gas modernization project, which will replace 12 miles of gas main throughout Princeton, was originally expected to begin in January. <clears throat> Due to several factors, the project has been delayed and will now start on Tuesday, February 21st. The contractor for PSE&G Ferreira Construction will be working at night at the intersection of Witherspoon Street and Paul Robeson Place and Wiggins Street. Work hours will be from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. The earlier start in the evening is to reduce the impact of the noise of saw cutting and jackhammering on the surrounding residents. Work will progress north on Witherspoon Street and will be during the day if traffic can be accommodated and the work can be coordinated with the PSE&G Electric Utility Pole Replacement Project that's ongoing right now and the Witherspoon Street Improvements Project <clears throat> which we hope to get started very soon. Um, we hope that PSE&G will complete their work on Witherspoon Street and the ad adjoining side streets before our contractor starts work on phase two. PSE&G also has to install a temporary regulator to maintain gas pressures throughout the system and decommission the regulator at the corner of Witherspoon Street and Spring Street. And I apologize for the technical details here, but it, it, it is rather complicated. <clears throat> um, the Witherspoon Street and Spring Street regulator is in the way of our Witherspoon Street Phase 1 project. The temporary regulator needs to be installed on Van Devender Avenue at the corner of Park Place. We have directed PSE&G to perform this work at night as well, since the impact to traffic would be too detrimental to allow them to close even one lane of Van Deventer during the day. PSE&G is presently trying to determine how to accommodate this requirement because they did want to do it during the day. The crew that performs this work is presently assigned, and there is only one crew in the entire Trenton region, is currently assigned to, the, to monitor the regulator at Spring Street while our Witherspoon Street improvements project are being constructed within 20, 100 feet of it. Shifting the crew to night work means they won't be able to monitor our project during the day, so we've told them that we will adjust Earl, our contractor's work, to stay more than 100 feet from the Spring Street regulator when they need to be in, on Van Deventer at night. Um, they anticipate that they can get the work done on Van Deventer in 10 days, um, so we're keeping our fingers crossed. But as I said, they're trying to figure out how to get it all done at night um, through uh, expediting some uh, precast manufacturing of the vault that they have to put in. Uh, under the sidewalk. And that's the update on the PSE&G gas modernization project. I'm glad to hear it's so easy and there's very little to worry about. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for trying to figure all that out. It's a lot to do. Anybody have any questions for Jim before we move on? Anything else from engineering? No guys are good? Bernie, anything else? Okay. All right, let's go to presentations. First up is area in need of rehabilitation of certain property in the municipality of Princeton identified as block 5901, lots one, two, three, and four, block 6001, lot 14, located at 601 Prospect Avenue, also known as Textile Research Institute or TRI. And Mr. Um, going all the way back even to the beginning of the um, third round of affordable housing. 
housing uh, litigation as a potential redevelopment uh, site as a compliance mechanism in the municipalities for the housing um, settlement. Um, for various reasons during that, we were not able to assure the parties in the court that the site would actually meet the criteria for permitting during that, so the site actually did not make it into our final compliance plan, um, but we have kept the site on our radar, and as we have been moving forward um, with things over the, the time, more information has become available, and one of the recommendations that we have, knowing that the fourth round of affordable housing obligations are essentially on our doorstep, um, is kind of keeping track of these sites and being able to engage in the process prospectively um, as opposed to doing so essentially in the middle of litigation where you're really constrained by the court rules, mediations, um, and frankly the leverage that developers have um, during an actual active litigation process. Um, so with this site, um, we have tasked uh, our planning department and uh, also one of our uh, municipal consultants, Jim Kyle, who was planning to be here this evening and apologize for that, he's actually double booked. Um, so could not actually make it here, uh, especially when, when there are technological limitations this evening, but he does send his apologies. Um, but to, in any event, uh, under the local redevelopment housing law, municipalities actually have two paths that remain available. Um, if the tools that are available under normal zoning um, are not really going to result in a development um, of the site. Um, one is the area in need of redevelopment, which council is uh, very well familiar with. And the other is an area in need of rehabilitation, which is what we are recommending we consider here. Um, the main difference between the two um, is in an area in need of rehabilitation, you do not have the tools of condemnation, uh, nor do you have the ability to grant long-term tax exemptions or what everybody commonly refers to as a 30-year pilot. Um, and because of that, um, if a pilot is not necessary or you don't need to get additional lands, um, the, the formalized process of redevelopment um, is actually simplified for an area in need of rehabilitation. And there are some statutory criteria that must be uh, met, uh, and usually that can be done at the staff level doing a, um, either a study, an investigation, um, looking at infrastructure, looking at the site, um, and if the conclusion of the staff is that it actually meets the criteria, it is actually referred to the governing body uh, via a proposed resolution, which is what you have this evening. Um, by statute, that resolution, uh, and if the governing body agrees, is then referred to the planning board for their review and comment and recommendations, and then we come back to the governing body for this evening, this is listed as a presentation because there's no formal action that needs to be uh, taken. There are no real considerations other than um, your consideration of referring this over to the panel. Um, had Mr. Kyle been here this evening, he would have uh, reported to you that he did uh, take a look at the site and do a tour of the property, did look at some of the records that were available, and does conclude that the site meets the statute criteria specifically, um, and it's set forth in the proposed resolution that there is a pattern of vacancy and abandonment and underutilization uh, of the site, and also there are known environmental contamination that is in the process of uh, being remediated out there, um, but that an area in need of rehabilitation would actually provide the municipality with uh, the tools that are available under the local redevelopment housing law to proactively um, plan for uh, the development of this site, and as I said from the beginning, um, and being able to do so proactively as opposed to uh, leading to the first round. So um, if that's uh, okay with everyone, the uh, resolution would then just be referred over to the planning board. They would have up to 45 days um, to do their review, and it would come back here. As soon as uh, that does come back, we would list this on an agenda, and that's when we would be considering this formally for Thank you. All right, I'm going to start on this side. Any questions or comments anyone has here? Layton. 
I just want to thank you for the explanation you helped me with today so I could have a better understanding of this. Thank you. Okay. Going to this side, any questions or comments? Okay. All right. So hearing no one wanting to tackle you to say don't do anything else? <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. Next up is Princeton University Mobility Plan Update. Charles Tennyson, Director of Transportation and Parking Services. And Kristen, I'm sorry? Are they or not? We can just turn around and look. You got a. We're not on? Yeah. Hi there. Uh, Kristen Applegate, uh, Princeton University, uh, with my colleague Charlie Tennyson, Director of Transportation and Parking Services at Princeton. We are absolutely delighted to be here with you all tonight. Uh, this presentation grew out of regular meetings that staff at the university have with the engineering uh, and planning department to compare notes on uh, areas of mutual interest in planning and engineering. So we thank uh, Jim and Deanna and the rest of the team. Uh, for working with us and Bernie. Um, this presentation uh, was discussed at that committee. Uh, we subsequently, I think, met with the Traffic and Safety Committee, um, and uh, a suggestion was to bring this uh, to mayor and council so that uh, you all and the public could know about some of the work that we're doing at the university, which dovetails nicely with a lot of the great work that you all are doing. So uh, with, without further ado, I will hand it over to our campus expert, Charlie Tennyson. All right, thank you, Kristen. Let's see if I can get this. Yeah, you gotta pretty much eat the microphone for us to hear you. How, how does that sound? Um, oh, you gotta be really close, okay. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council for the opportunity to provide this update about transportation and mobility at Princeton. As, as Kristen said, uh, my name's Charlie Tennyson. I'm the director for transportation and parking services. I'm also a Princeton resident. I got my waste carts. I call them trash cans, but maybe, maybe I shouldn't. But I got my, my trash can today. I'm east of Harrison Street, um, so thank you for those. Um, <clears throat> tonight, I just want to provide not only some updates about specific transportation and mobility programs on campus, but also hope to give you a sense of our holistic approach to planning for and providing mobility options as a campus. Um, so first, I'm going to start with a, a video. It's just under four minutes. It literally illustrates the important uh, foundational principles that came from our, our recent campus mobility framework project. Uh, which brought together stakeholders from across the university. It also brought some members of this council uh, to campus for our open house back in February 2020, one of our last uh, public events uh, before the pandemic, and, and continues to guide the work of our capital plan and daily programming and operations. So with that, let's see if this will work. The campus mobility principles are 10 principles that distill what we learn from our stakeholder engagement and will really provide guidelines for us as a campus and how it will grow and how the physical campus will change into the future. I think everyone on campus can find themselves represented in the principles from this project and we hope that everyone will consider them and think about the importance of safety, accessibility for everyone and just the importance of making the campus an easy, safe place to walk and move around and do the great things that this campus is so well known for. The Campus Mobility Principles. One, nearly all movement around campus is human powered and low emission. Two, campus is designed to be compact, walkable, and easy to serve with transit. Three, Alternatives to driving are plentiful and easy for everyone to use. Four, when designing a place, ask first how pedestrians and bikes will use it. Five, the campus is built and maintained so that all people have access, including when they have a disability. Six, campus streets and paths don't just move people, they also carry ideas and conversations. Seven, 
walking and biking is so appealing that few people choose transit for short trips. Eight, it's clear which modes have priority on each street and path. Nine, motorized vehicles are mostly behind the scenes to limit their impact on the campus experience. And 10, the university works with partners to improve transportation in nearby communities. There are some really exciting things that we've already been able to put in place as a result of the campus mobility framework. One example are the College Road and Lawrence Drive bike and pedestrian advisory lanes. These are lanes that create more space for bike and pedestrians to share the road safely. I discovered them and I thought, wow, these bike lanes are a huge improvement because now the cars go more slowly and it's safer for everyone. We've also got a new transit network. We think that's way easier for people to understand and to use. Buses come more frequently, and it creates an all-day connection between the campus and the town of Princeton and Princeton Junction and the Northeast Corridor so that people might catch trains to New York or Philadelphia. Coming from Manhattan, I have noticed a change in Tiger Transit and the availability of more options for taking the Tiger Transit train from Princeton Junction. And then of course we have Tiger Access. Tiger Access is a new service that's a reservable van service that people with disabilities or with injuries can use to make trips across campus on a reserved basis. Yeah, I'm really grateful that Princeton has added the Tiger Access service. Uh, it's really great to know that I can be picked up anywhere and brought anywhere where I need assistance. And we're really excited to see the new electric Tiger Transit fleet rolling on campus very soon. I hope that people will continue to see how our principles can apply on campus today and in the future. And I hope they will continue to keep them in mind in their own work as they contribute to our community. All right, so you, in that video you would have noticed my co-star um, who's here, Debbie Foster. She's our Deputy Vice President for University Services and, and a huge advocate um, and part of this work. So I appreciate her being here. Um, all right, so hopping right into some more specific program programmatic updates. Um, first things first, uh, we're really, really excited and proud of the development of Tiger Transit as a service um, and all of the things that, that's happening with, with this system. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice if you knew our old service, um, this is a much more linear system. Uh, it's a cleaner network, it's easier to understand. Trips are more direct as opposed to big sweeping one-way loops, so they're faster. Uh, and they, by concentrating service in this way, we can provide more service to each route. So no Tiger Transit route from 7 a.m. to midnight operates on uh, worse than 30 minute frequencies and we have 10 to 15 minute frequencies on most of our routes at peak hours. A um, couple other things about the service, uh, you noticed in the video the all-day connections to the junction um, from different parts of campus and town. We've of course got our weekend shopping service and our service to the medical center. Those are, that's a, a weekday route. Um, all of them are open and free to the public of course. Uh, we've got better and more robust and more accurate data collection and that's informing our service plans. So again, we expect to see the service um, and the system perform better and better. Uh, we've got better wayfinding, better maps. Um, Again, cleaner signage, real-time arrival information is something we're starting to deploy across all of our stops. So that's at one location now. I'll show you at the Stadium Drive Garage in, in a bit. Um, but we're deploying that, that same technology throughout the system. Um, we've also got Tiger Access, which is a point-to-point -point service for people with disabilities and injuries. Um, it's open to visitors as well to the campus. So if you need to get a door-to-door, -door, sort of curb-to-curb -curb connection that's not a part of the Tiger Transit Network, we can provide it there. Um, and then lastly, and I'll talk a bit about this a little bit later, the Lyft program that we have. So the university has a contract with Lyft, and we use passes to subsidize trips for people making, um, who need to move between campus facilities that aren't served directly by this network. Um, we're pleased to see that people are coming back to transit post-pandemic. I think we're going to continue to see our new routes grow in ridership due to the improved design that, that I mentioned previously and ultimately outperform the old system. Um, you heard in the video, we are really excited about the elect electrification of the system. So the fleet, um, we're currently turning over to, to all battery electric buses. It's been a robust three-year effort. And throughout the course of this semester, we're planning to decommission the entire uh, diesel fleet. So by summer, only electric vehicles will be operating in town and around campus. Um, when this work's completed, the university will be among the very few uh, operations in the country with a fully electric fleet. And 
I'm really excited to be able to share our playbook with our partner agencies and, and regional partners in the area um, about how we were able to accomplish that. Everybody's process is different, but we're happy to share ours. Uh, the 17 vehicle fleet will depict campus um, images uh, on them. So you see an example there on the screen. Um, also, I, th I think a thoughtful addition was marking very clearly free shuttle service for all on every vehicle. You can sort of see them blocked a little by the tree there, but every bus has that marking, so there's no mistaking who can ride it. Uh, in addition to producing zero emissions, the vehicles are really nice, I have to say, as a, as a transit person. Um, they offer the latest technology for accessibility with a, a fully self-assisted uh, automated wheelchair position and audio announcements for each stop. Um, we'll be charging the vehicles at two sites, a smaller charging facility located on campus and the large surface parking lot, which is adjacent to Faculty Road and Elm Drive there, sort of on the west side of campus. We can charge five vehicles there at one time. And that facility should be coming online into this week or next week. So we're, we're kind of right at this inflection point. Um, and we'll begin immediately operating our first seven vehicles that we've received as soon as we've um, got that site fully up and running. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So then the primary and larger charging facility will be, um, will be able to charge about 16 vehicles at one time. That's located at a university-owned property in West Windsor at 755 Alexander Road. We expect that facility should complete commissioning and come online in May, at which point um, we should have received all of our vehicles. So we should be fully electric by the summer. Uh, look forward to hosting anyone who wants to come learn about that operation. So agencies, members of council, um, really anyone who's interested to learn, uh, we'll, we'll be happy to have you out. Uh, the university's mobility program, though, is, is more than just Tiger Transit. So we have a number of services that support car-free life on campus, uh, primarily for our students, but also for faculty and staff. Uh, we have a 15-vehicle enterprise car share fleet, which provides about 700 trips per month uh, for the university community, or 25 or so a day. We also have a contract with Zipcar for two vehicles uh, that are located at Princeton Station. Those cars are available to anyone with a Zipcar membership. They're also well used, and we hope we can find more ways to promote those vehicles to the residents of Princeton so that they realize they're there. I think there's also a vehicle at Princeton Junction. Uh, and then Lyft. So Lyft's been a really good solution for us, um, serving university facilities like the offices located on Canal Point in West Windsor in lieu of transit. And so the way this works is the university, uh, my team works with Lyft to build a geo-fenced and if desired time-restricted service area. And our office shares a link with eligible users so that they can request a fully subsidized ride with Lyft. We're also able to provide fully subsidized daily connections for commuters who take New Jersey Transit to Princeton Junction Station and then need a last mile connection to some university location that's not served by, by Tiger Transit. We've found Lyft to be a, a really reliable option. One that provides critical connections at a fraction of the cost and importantly emissions um, of a fixed route shuttle where demand does not warrant shuttle service necessarily, but in cases where we need to make connections for people. So I know that may sound familiar to members of this council. Um, so this isn't meant to be a Lyft commercial. <laughs> it's just that many counties, agencies, cities are partnering with, with groups like this. And I think Lyft's been building out their program and, and they've worked for us. So just here to report that, that that's an important part of our operation. Um, as you may know, Zagster Bike Share went out of business early in the pandemic. Our office reclaimed a fleet of about 130 Zagster bikes. Uh, we've contracted with local bike shops um, in town and, uh, to repurpose the bikes as rentals, and we've been renting them at low cost to students since last year. It's been a very popular program. We can't, we can't keep the bikes on the shelf. Uh, students are using them all the time. We're also currently in RFP for a potentially electric and dockless bike share program. So uh, we have identified a couple of finalists. I should note those companies are not shown on the screen. I just grabbed a, a generic uh, bike share uh, picture to share here. But we'll be continuing to understand the best program for our community, including things like fleet size, geo-fenced rides and parking areas, speed controls, all of the things that you need to consider with, with a solution like this. And it's something we're gonna do in really close coordination with the municipality and our partners here. Um, I don't yet have a clear launch date or, or when we think we'll bring this to campus. We really want to wait for the right time. We want to answer every question. We want to make sure the infrastructure is ready to support um, these uh, electric bikes. At this time, we do not have plans to add scooters in the next generation of the, of the program. So I, th I see some smiles. Um, you may know about the university's program to reduce single occup occupancy vehicle commutes called Revise Your Ride. Uh, like Tiger Transit, we've seen Revise Your Ride participation rebound close to pre-COVID levels with about 1,400 participants currently. All programs require participants to forego an annual parking permit and provide incentives for those who, see we've got some our celebrities here, can bike or walk. 
Uh, you get a 50% subsidy on any rail pass to, to ride the Northeast Corridor. Um, there are incentives to carpool, including closer parking spaces, spaces, which is always kind of more popular than the cash incentive we have is the, is the parking space. This is my favorite one, a free, a free New Jersey Transit bus pass. So if you'll take the bus, we'll give you the bus pass. Um, or lastly, a, um, you can participate in a uh, van pool that's a fully subsidized van that's, that's, um, that's, um, that we receive from Enterprise, and you also get some, some uh, incentives to do that. So that's another popular program that's, that's grown a bit. Um, let's see. So new projects under the university's capital plan include planning for inf infrastructure that will include that will improve accessibility in the bicycle pedestrian experience. So I want to show a couple images here to, again, you'll relate these back to the principles that we saw in the video. The new building for the Environmental Studies and School of Engineering and Applied Sciences is, of course, bordered on the south by Ivy Lane, which will include bike advisory lanes, or ABLs. So a couple more references coming up on ABLs. Um, similarly, the university is partnering with several public agencies and the municipality to plan dedicated bike lanes on Washington Road. I should also add, like the intersection at Washington Road and Nassau Street, the university is planning to introduce a pedestrian all-walk phase to the Ivy Lane and Washington Road inter excuse me, intersection once the ESNC's project is completed. Um, you may have already used the new Stadium Drive garage, which opened last summer in August. If you have not, I recommend getting out to a basketball game one night soon and check that out. Um, it's a 1,500-space parking facility that includes 65 electric vehicle chargers, which are available to commuters and visitors. Um, wider paths to support, and you'll see this as a theme as more projects come online on campus, but wider paths to support larger groups of pedestrians and other sort of wheel devices accessing the area. Um, lots of covered bike parking, naturally. Uh, a climate-controlled transit center. You can see my, my uh, co-inspector Griffey, the Springer Spaniel, in that picture there, checking out the transit shelter. And of course, I mentioned earlier, the real-time uh, bus arrival information. So that, this is, a, I think it's a 42-inch screen that's down at the new garage, but we'll have 13-inch screens coming out at a half dozen stops or so around the system um, this semester. So let's see, lastly, I wanted to, prov oh, so let me see, uh, da, da, da. oh yeah. So one of the harder issues we continue to work through is managing scooters on campus. So I know that's a familiar issue for you all in town. Um, it's one that's presenting challenges for municipalities and universities across the country. So you can take comfort in knowing that we're not alone on that one. Um, we did launch a public awareness campaign in partnership with students and other stakeholders uh, on social media last spring. You can go to our website and kind of see some fun videos there. It's an effort we're going to renew this semester. Uh, the university's also adopted a temporary wayfinding program with signage around campus. Um, the goal there is to really kind of send rolling devices into wider corridors where they will have less conflict with pedestrians. Um, and as part of our more robust registration program where we're going to be requiring all of our students to register the, their scooters and they come back to campus in the fall, uh, we're going to have a lot of outreach and make clear that there are places in town where you cannot have these devices on the sidewalk. So I know some of our colleagues in the municipality will appreciate that. Um, lastly, just wanted to provide an update that, I guess you saw in the video, our pilot of advisory bike lanes, or again that term ABL, has been a success on College Road and Lawrence Drive. Um, the shared drive lane is intended to slow vehicle speeds and provide greater agency for cyclists, or even in some cases, pedestrians where sidewalks may be limited or insufficient. Um, in advance of implementing these, which it was fall 2020, we communicated changes uh, to the roads to, to the university community by email and other notices, but we also deployed variable message boards um, in addition to new signage on the roadway to alert motorists to the change. The feedback we've received is that these are really working, as intended. Um, university community really likes them. We haven't seen any reported accidents or safety issues as a result of this change. Uh, we like them so much, we're going to continue to adopt them at other places on campus. Um, I'd say, uh, Kristen mentioned this at the start, in conversations with the municipality's traffic safety committee, we've discussed that William Street could be a really good candidate, or we think it really is, uh, particularly particularly given the low levels of vehicular traffic on the road, uh, this would be a really good improvement for cyclists and consistent with a lot of the other corridors and, and sort of how we're designing them on campus. So I hope, uh, Mr. Mayor, I kept it to the time limit I suggested and would be happy to answer questions with my colleague here. You did great, thank you. All right, we'll start on this side, David. Yeah, Charlie, I noticed in the rendering of Ivy Lane that the advisory bike lanes appeared to be a different paving material or at least um, entirely painted, which I think looks like a great traffic calming 
you know, enhancement of advisory liens. And I'm, it's a two-part question. One is, is that real or is it just a rendering? And secondly, um, if, if it is real, are you looking to try to do that elsewhere as well with your advisory lanes as roads get this repaved? Is where, this is where we need Ron McCoy to tell us what's <laughs> the reality between rendering and what will be constructed. But exactly what you said, um, Councilman, is creating a space that it's very clear it's a shared space, slow speeds, expect to see cyclists and others. So uh, knowing how these renderings work, it's probably somewhere... <laughs> between the photo and and the okay. actual world. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, Eve. Uh, hi, Charlie and Kristen. Thanks uh, for this, and, and Debbie as well for your star appearance in the video. Um, yeah, uh, this is great. This is you know really uh, bringing forth to a wider audience what we talked about in in traffic safety and when we went on the tour with the first electric bus. I can't believe you have seven already. That's very uh, impressive. Um, so I had uh, a couple of questions. Like one of them you sort of started to address, which is the scooters, but I'm wondering also about e-bikes um, and, and campus safety and, you know, also uh, the map that you showed of the municipal restrictions is for bikes, not just e-bikes, but any bikes and scooters on the sidewalk. But um, I'm wondering how you're conceptualizing, you know, scooters and e-bikes sharing these spaces with uh, pedestrians and I don't know if the term is normal bikers or, uh, well, you know, non-e-bikes. Um, how, do, how do you see that working out, especially since, you know, the, the speeds of the e-bikes can be quite, you know, rapid and, and they're quiet. Um, it's a good question and one I'm getting a lot on campus. So I'd say the first thing is the attractive thing to sort of to me and sort of my peers around the country who who manage these systems that, that vendors provide is that with the share and especially with all the technology now around those shares, you can really control the devices. So you can limit the speeds in a really specific way. Even, I mean, some of these companies, uh, and this is where we'll, we'll make them prove it first, but I wanna see them uh, come to campus, but you know, you can operate you could make it so that the device c can't operate on a sidewalk and can't on the street. It gets kind of that level of definition. Um, and then certainly controlling the speeds, if you know, say, the, say in campus in Elm Drive or on Washington Road, we're more comfortable with a higher speed of you know, 10, 15 miles per hour, but in other areas, we know it's really pedestrian heavy and we either want the device to stop or go down to two or three miles an hour. Those are all things that we can control um, with the better technology these companies are deploying. So, and, I've, and we've seen them deployed at other camp and as, campuses with, with, with pretty good success. That's kind of the opposite of that story is what we're struggling with with the personally owned scooters. We can't control the personally owned scooter. Um, so we're, we're working to do a few things uh, to kind of help alleviate the stress those are causing. One is, and this is a longer process, but modifying the infrastructure where we can. So I mean, the, the image on the screen is kind of, you know, says it all. If we can give people a place to go where they can move quickly and they're clearly designated, that alleviates the nice people there on the sidewalk from having to, to dodge them. Um, that's a slower effort. So in the, you know, that's going to come in, in um, fits and starts as projects are delivered. This, this stuff takes time. So in the meantime, Combination of signage. This is the, the first time on campus we've ever really shown cyclists where to go with signs is this that temporary wayfinding signage I showed you. So we're studying that. We've got a really good consultant team that's looking at actually changes from before and after and where people are going. Um, we're trying a number of other things too, but I think we'll, we'll do a lot of outreach and education. Um, but I don't know if I missed any of your question or Kristen, would you add anything? Yeah. So it, it's, it's a combination of efforts, but I think it the nice thing about the share is that you can control it. And we're hoping if people are gonna choose that for first last mile options, that they would choose the share and then we could have more control over how they operate. Yeah. So, so the assumption is that the e-bikes that are on campus are primarily gonna be your e-bikes rather than an e-bike that a student or other person has brought from home and that, therefore you have a higher degree of control. That's exactly right. Well, okay. So there are a couple things we tell undergrads in particular, but really all students when they come to Princeton. One is, well, not only do you not need a car, but you can't have one. So we say you can't bring your vehicle, which is why the car share and these other, other um, services are so important. The second thing is um, think about uh, 
alternatives before you bring a bike if you're not a cyclist or a scooter. So come to campus, walk around, figure things out. And so that's where the share really comes in handy is if we can get some people to try that, that's a good alternative. They don't have to add their own device to the mix. Yeah. And one more small follow-up yeah. to that. So on, on the electric bus, we talked about the need for some kind of sound because the buses were so quiet. So I'm, yeah. in, I'm, I'm looking forward to riding and hearing that sound. I don't know what you decided on, but is it possible to do something like that with the e-bikes, e-scooters? Again, I think, and this is not really specific to uh, the university, but some of our older residents especially have complained that the bikes and the scooters creep up on them and they don't hear them and and being older and I'm rapidly approaching older myself. I'm older, but I'm gonna be even older. Um, so, you know, that response time is is limited. So I, I don't know if that's something that's thought about in the industry at all, the same way it is for the electric buses of having some kind of unobtrusive sound that kind of acts as a warning. I haven't seen that on the e-devices. I mean, they've got bells and other things, but I haven't, I haven't yet seen that deployed. We'll be, we're going to be very deliberate with this deployment. I, I'll be honest, people aren't beating down the door to have, have a share come back, and that's, that tells us something. I do think that they're, I think they have a role to play in our community if we can do it smart and do it the right way, but um, that's one of the questions I'd like to continue to examine. But on the vehicles, yes. So we're, we're going to try a couple different aftermarket um, you sort of noises, if you will. But before we put them on all the vehicles, we want to pick one that everybody's okay with. So don't want to trade the loud diesel vehicles for another. One of the options was something that sounded like a loud diesel vehicle. How funny is that? Can you imagine putting that on the EVs? So, yeah. Michelle? Thank you for this. It's, it's really exciting. Um, you know, you're an educational institution that's educating our community on all these wonderful sustainability um, and mobility plans that we can learn from. Um, you know, I hope, I know that we'll partner on many things. Um, you know, I mean, you've given me so many ideas to think about too tonight. Zipcar, Lyft, uh, the bike share. Um, but I'm just really intrigued with this photo on the right because this is a two-way bike lane on one side of the road. Uh, one of the big challenges we have is uh, throughout the municipality is the narrowness of all of our streets. And we have our engineers here, and we know, and, and so there's a great desire to have bike lanes, um, but we have these narrow streets. So not to get into the details tonight, but this is something that we can learn um, and work on together because I think that there's a lot of lessons here that we can take when we're doing all of our streetscape design uh, throughout town. So I just thank you so much for, for sharing this. So if I could just add there, so for clarity, the, the image that you're looking at on the right um, is Washington Road coming, what I'll say, up the hill from Faculty Road towards Nassau. And to your point about width, this is an opportunity because of the width in the county right of way to take advantage of being able to create this separated bike lane. Um, we're very excited about this. We've had initial conversations with the county about it. They too are embracing multimodal transit and getting infrastructure in place. So um, as we, and, and there are stra strategies that once you get to the point on Washington Road where you can't take that forward, how you transition to the other um, settings that you have along that corridor. Um, I think as we've said in a planning group and I think as we've met as you know, staff, you can't build an entire system overnight and you have to take the opportunities that you have. Mm -hmm. So we think that the opportunities that we've identified to start implementing alternative, um, the ABLs, advisory bike lanes on roads that the university owns, um, have been beneficial, and we think that being able to take the opportunity of public-private partnership, which would, private is the university, public in this case will be the county, um, we're very excited about starting to lay the groundwork for building an infrastructure, a system of infrastructure that will go seamlessly from campus spaces, county roads, municipal roads. Because after all, you know, when you're on your bike or your scooter, you don't know where the lines of you know municipal versus township municipal versus county end. No, ab absolutely. I think this is a really interesting solution to uh, a lot of our streets through town. Um, you know, we don't want the bikes and the CBD on the sidewalk. 
but we want them to come, so we have to find solutions uh, through town. So One of the things that we would optimistically like to request uh, from you all is uh, permission to work with your staff in the coming weeks um, in order to um, begin to develop plans for advisory bike lanes, in a specific case, on William Street, uh, because that is public, uh, a public street. We would need the, the um, mayor and council to pass an ordinance, I believe it is, that would permit that sort of um, striping to be put on the street. Of course, it wouldn't mean that it would just appear. You would have other, uh, mm -hmm. there would be other ways that it would be approved at the municipality. But as a starting point, we would need you all as mayor and council to pass an ordinance allowing that type of infrastructure um, to be implemented. And that's where my knowledge stops and I will let others who are more expert continue. Thank you. Leticia. Yes, thank you. Uh, that was a very impressive uh, presentation. I, uh, it reminds me of uh, the, my, when my visits to Seattle and how I've taken advantage of the various modes of transportation and how accessible it is. Uh, but I, I wanted to uh, ask about, I know at one point there was a time when uh, the Tiger Transit was made available to uh, members of our community, specifically from our underserved population who lack their own transportation so that they could have access to the medical center. Uh, and I don't know if I missed it in your presentation, whether that's still an option, and if yes, whether there are other locations that our, our residents could take advantage of, of the uh, transit or transportation that's available. That's a, I'm, re I'm really glad that question was asked. Um, everything on this network is available to the members of, of every member of the community. So f free, okay. open access for all. I think we've struggled to get that message out collectively, um, all of us, kind of the municipality and the university. It's just, you know, it's, you see the vehicle, it's branded with the university branding. It's kind of confusing. It's a fair free system we want everyone to ride. Uh, so hopefully the new vehicles that say everyone should ride will encourage more yeah. people to get on. Uh, but specifically, yes. So the whole system is open to the public that you see on the map here. There are a couple of services. There's a, you know, a late night on demand for mm -hmm. students, that kind of thing that's, that, that's for university sort of affiliate. But this system is, is fully open to the public. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm confident in saying that our, uh, is Jeff here? No, Jeff's not here. In confidence saying that our uh, outreach coordinator from our human services department would be glad to uh, work with you on, on getting the word out to, to our members of our community that who could use it. Thank we you. would love to, to do that. So I will make a note to follow up. We have a communication staffer on our team. Um, you'll see that the medical center is listed there. I think there is confusion in the community about yes. who can get on the service. So that's a yeah. great, this is exactly Wonderful. why we wanted to come have the conversation. Great, thank you. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Mia? Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm disappointed that this was not recorded. Um, is there, was there any recording tonight? Is there any recording going on tonight? Because it's not on YouTube and... No, it's not on YouTube, but it is streaming. And it will be posted on the website. Okay. Um, because the Transit Committee has been working for some time to apply to the Transit Trust Fund to do a mobility plan for the whole community, which is similar to this. And I think everyone can see how exciting this is um, to, I mean, we've done some work. We have the bicycle mobility or the the bicycle mobility plan that's part of the master plan. And we have a bunch of different studies. but. Um, We've been working in the Transit Committee to put together a comprehensive proposal to the Transit Trust Fund so that the community could have its own um, mobility plan similar to what the university has. And of course, there would be many points in which we would um, you know, have synergies and, and um, which we're already working on. But um, anyway, I'm glad that, to hear that everyone is excited about this and sees the potential because we hope to have something similar for the town as well in the not too distant future. So, If I could just add, our playbook is open. So we're, we're very, uh, you can see all of the programs we do. We're happy to share sort of all of the work. So very, yeah, I look forward to it. Thank you. Leighton. Thanks, Mayor. I, I just, you know, this is like really, really, really exciting and really, really good stuff. 
Um, congratulations, uh, smart growth is looking like really, really enticing here in Princeton. Uh, you, you literally, no, no pun intended, connected all the dots with regard to um, handicap, accessory, uh, seniors, getting people to the medical center. My only hope is that uh, when we talk about collaboration between your great uh, world-class departments and our great, great world-class departments with regard to engineering, construction, uh, architecture, that this would just be the first of many uh, collaborative efforts that the university and the municipality can make in many different areas. So this is an exciting time for Princeton. And, and I'm sorry that this could not be broadcast the way our, our other um, meetings have been broadcast because need, people need to see, hear, and understand this because this is an exciting time for Princeton. And thanks again for the presentation. Thank you. OK, were there any questions that you were hoping we asked that you had a great answer for that we didn't ask you, or you're good? <laughs> I think we know where to find you. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, next up is the 2023 leaf, brush, and log collection schedule. Sorry about that. Getting ourselves set up over here. I think we're good. Uh, so if you all recall, we had come to council back in December, on December 19th, to talk about leaf and brush collection. And um, so we are back after looking at our leaf and brush collection with the waste team. And so tonight we're just going to present more information and give you um, an update on what the program will look like. Um, so looking ahead to 2023, we have a lot of things in flux right now in terms of stormwater permitting. We have a new municipal stormwater permit that is increasing the street sweeping requirements that the municipality must adhere to. We also have increased uh, system maintenance requirements. And this affects the leaf and brush collection program, um, mainly because of um, the contaminants of the leaf and brush that could get into the stormwater system. So we are working with staff to figure out how to um, update our system to be in compliance on that side of things. At the ecological facility, which we run jointly with Lawrence, uh, we're getting to the end of our five-year uh, shared service agreement with them. It's set up that it can roll over into another five-year program. Uh, but at the same time, there is uh, a new DEP stormwater permit for wood waste recycling facilities. And uh, looking at our existing facility, it is not a big site, and the requirements for the stormwater management may require that we take some of the area that is currently used for leaf and wood mulch operations uh, to be transferred into stormwater management facilities. So Lawrence is working with a consultant to come up with a concept plan of what uh, impact that may have on the facility. They're also looking at the testing requirements for the stormwater that would leave the site. Um, and as we get more information on that, we'll share it with council and our waste team as we look ahead to what um, impact that may have on the leaf and brush collection program. Um, also, adding into this is looking at how do we can control costs, how do we increase safety. Uh, we did have the fatality on Mercer Road by a landscaper that was 
um, managing leaf um, from private sites. So, so all of these thoughts are in our, our minds as we look ahead to what the leaf and brush collection program should be. Um, this, uh, the new collection for this year, we've already completed the brush and Christmas tree collection, uh, but we're looking to do three collections for brush in the spring and three collections in the fall. Leaves, uh, we're looking at two collections in the spring and 10 collections in the fall. This is reduced from what uh, we have done in previous years. And we are still looking into whether um, we can transfer the LEAF program into a fully bagged collection in the fall. Uh, we're working to identify landscape companies that can take the bagged leaves or what impact that will have on the quality of our compost if we are to do it at the ecological facility. So it's a work in progress right now, but we need to get the schedule out so the public at least knows what to anticipate for the frequency of collections and how it will be staggered throughout the year. Um, in terms of how we compare to other municipalities with this modified or reduced collection program. Uh, at the very bottom of the screen, you'll see where Princeton falls. We still have a um, comparable number of leaf collections compared to other municipalities in Mercer County. Um, it's the same with brush collection. We're uh, getting more in alignment to what our um, other municipal peers are doing. So while it's a reduction in uh, the number of collections within Princeton year to year, it's still uh, pretty, you know, pretty comparable with what's being done in the, in the county. Uh, in addition to the collection program, the waste team is working to update the ordinance on leaf and brush collection. Uh, one of the big sticking points with leaf and brush, or with the, the brush, is that you're supposed to put it in three by three by three piles and you have a, a limited number of piles that you can do. Uh, that was predicated upon manual collection of that material because you know there was also reference to bundling. Um, because we're using the claw, we have automated equipment. We're tr we want to simplify that so it's three by three by 12 feet long. Um, so you don't have that, that manual separation um, into the individual piles. Uh, like I said, we're looking at uh, a bag leaf only collection for the fall. We haven't uh, gotten all the data together to help council make that decision at this point, um, but we'll continue to work on that uh, over the summer before those collections start. Um, we're also looking at um, Sustainable Princeton and PEC doing um, education and outreach activities and selling composter and rain barrels at reduced rates to Princeton residents. Um, in addition to that, in terms of compliance, we will be working with DP, DPW to make sure that they are not collecting materials outside of the schedule, um, and that we would be work. The compliance officer would be issuing uh, warnings and violations for those people that are outside compliance. Last fall, I think we reported that there were 250 warnings given for materials. Uh, put out outside of the scheduled pickup time. Um, Christina and Jenny are here. Um, they have quite an extensive amount of educational and outreach programs that um, will be 
working with the community on. We have the Earth Day program. Um, this is actually one thing that we're pretty excited about. It's a second recycling shred fest type activity that is going to be happening this year. Uh, usually we just do the activity in the fall, uh, but we're bringing it in in the spring as well. And Sustainable Princeton is partnering with us to do some educational programs at the same time. They've also been uh, very, very, very helpful in uh, a lot of the social media activities that uh, have been going on related to waste and uh, related to reusing your old garbage cans. So um, all of that, all the things to Sustainable Princeton for that work. Um, and we're also working on these ideas of how do you leave the leaves rather than collect them in bags or have them hauled away. So there's ideas like mulching your leaves with the mower. That's the mow mulch idea. You can uh, create leaf corrals or piles that uh, when the materials decompose, you can put back in your, your garden beds and um, building the brush pile for habitat for, uh, you know, birds, butterflies, that type of thing. So that's um, the overall schedule and program that we're working on this year. Um, you can take any questions. All right, I'm going to start on this side this time. Any questions? This side. Wow, great. Coming over here, David. Yeah, um, I was uh, really interested in reviewing the um, the waste uh, ordinance that we're acting on a little later this evening to see that leaf collection is part of the county um, recycling requirements basically and the question that i have about it is you know it it, it does talk in the ordinance the language is about the municipality collecting the leaves um, but i know that we have landscapers who do collect the leaves as well. There is language that requires uh, any hauler who's gonna be collecting recyclables, who's, who's a private hauler to be sort of licensed or authorized by the, by the county or the municipality. And I'm curious if there is a, an authorization component where landscapers, in order to take the leaves away, have to be um, somehow you know, authorized and and that we're making sure that they're recycling the leaves as we do when we collect them. I can't answer that completely, but I will say that if landscapers are bringing the material to the ecological facility, they do have to be registered with Lawrence um, to be able to use that facility. But. I can There's, follow up on the rest of that answer for yeah. you. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? I'm sorry. I've been somewhat involved in this, so I know how hard everyone on the staff has worked and how, how frustrated it's been as we've come up with one idea of another. Let's have townwide composting. Let's have only bagged leaves, and then reality hits in ways that we don't, you know, didn't anticipate and that really have restricted what we would ideally uh, like to do. And I just want to thank you and the staff for just persisting, like maybe we're not going to get 100% of what we want, but maybe we can get 80 um, and, you know, take small steps towards, you know, controlling our costs, reducing our emissions, you know, maintaining a, a healthier ecosystem on, you know, people's individual yards and providing incentives to do that. So just thank you and uh, looking forward to hearing, you know, what's what's going to happen in Lawrence, that, that the issues that will have to be resolved there will really inform what we'll be able to do and what our costs will be and what alternatives we'll be able to consider. So I think there'll be more, a lot more about leaves in, in the near future. So thank you.
Okay. Any others? All right. Thank you for that presentation. Next on the agenda is public comments for items not on the agenda. If anybody in the room you have, come on up. You're going to have to sit at the table because our little podium isn't here tonight. Your name and your address, and you have three minutes, and welcome. Here. Felicia Spitz, uh, 5 Hazlitt Avenue, and I'm speaking as chair of the Housing Authority. Um, I'm going to make a comment about something that you indicated was going to be taken off the agenda, um, the shared services agreement. Uh, I, um, I just want to let everybody know that I've been working on this for almost a year now, and I got approval from uh, Mark Leckington on June 7th of last year, and it took me all that time with the staffing turnovers um, to get this to the agenda tonight. And Mark had um, asked me to go ahead and get the bid documents pulled together and out, which I did, and they're due back on Wednesday of this week. So to hear that the ordinance has been um, taken off is a bit of a concern because no one at any point in the year that I've been working on this indicated anything about a HUD approval, nor was I aware that the Wi-Fi project, which part of this um, shared services agreement, um, it, it's been reappropriated, uh, or that's what was we're here about tonight. Um, I was not aware that that received any kind of HUD approval, so this is a bit of a curveball and a grave concern because, um, as you know, the funds were um, being used to, to uh, outfit preschool classrooms in partnership with the public schools who um, have already filed with the Department of Education that they are going to have these preschool classrooms available in September of this year. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned that this uh, postponement tonight is actually going to prevent um, two preschool classrooms, which is 30 children from being able to attend the school in the fall. And no one at any point mentioned this to me. Um, so I, I know this isn't a question and answer, it's just a comment phase, but I, I just wanted to let you all know um, it, this, there's a, an awful lot at stake tonight. Um, and like I said, I got an approval um, from Mark on June 7th, and it's really hard to um, move something forward when people continue to leave and we don't fill their positions and there aren't points of contact, but um, I think you all know me. Um, I'm <laughs> pretty pushy when it comes to, to getting things done in town and um, this is just a concern for me. So I wanted to let you all know what's at stake. Right, so usually we don't get into a back and forth in this, but I'll just tell you this. It is at Mark's recommendation that we not act on this resolution because he himself said that HUD needs to look at part of what we thought we were going to do with the money, and they are going to require a supplemental uh, amendment that has to be approved by them. So we can go back to Mark and see if this can be split off, but this is on his recommendation that we hold off on this. So we are following our consultant's uh, advice, and he's the expert in this, not us, to be honest. So we will, we will circle back with him, and we'll circle back with you. Thank you. I certainly hope he doesn't take the three months off again this year that he took off last year. Yeah. Other items from the public for items not on the agenda. All right. Hearing none, we'll close that part of the meeting. And now we go to our ordinance public hearings. First up, ordinance 2023-03, an ordinance by the municipality of Princeton authorizing the acquisition for $1 of about 34 acres of passive open space located between Ridgeview Road and Cherry Hill Road, Block 501, Lot 3, and portion of Block 501, Lot 10 on the Princeton tax maps. Is there, Eve's got the motion, Mia's got the second. Questions, comments from council? Okay, any public? Come, sure, please just come up and again, name and address and comment or question. It's only on Chen, 35 Macomb. Um, I'm coming back again to ask that the, again, it's the same request from my last time for the, uh, the previous Princeton Ridge uh, purchase is that please do not deed the land for permanent passive uh, recreation. It should be left open so that as our town 
grows that we'll still have an opportunity to develop that land for uh, active recreation. Okay. Did, I, I just want to make sure though, are you talking about these acres? I think, I thought last time when you had communicated with us, it was about the larger oh. track of land that we had. You're right, the previous one. Okay. But, and we had a discussion, I even had a discussion with the, uh, the business manager about this issue. I was told that if the deed were to, uh, we would have a further discussion about maybe not having the deed to um, be permanent passive activity, uh, recreation. That would, I would have still have a chance to um, maybe discuss this with, with, the, uh, with the town, but I never had that opportunity. Um, I think there's a, uh, a, a, even, because this is gonna, what happened is if we're gonna buy this land and just lock it in for passive recreation, we're gonna have the same problem you had at Hilltop Park because the synthetic turf was not the first time they approached our community about building uh, that turf field at Hilltop Park. It was the second time they approached us. Because the first time in 2011, we already told them, we don't want it there, right? But they, they don't have any other options, or they had other options, but they didn't want to pursue it. So they went back to Hilltop Park. So we had this whole rigmarole, and th th you lost time to use that fund for something actually that's worthwhile. Okay. So that's what happens. Um, okay. Thank you. Yep. Can, I, can I make a comment? Okay. Mr. Chen, I appreciate, I, I know that your, your concern, I think, underlying this is that we need more like playing fields, youth fields, that type of thing, well, right? Well, yeah, and, well, do you guys even actually right, just ever, we, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, just, I don't want to have a back and forth. I just was going to well, say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have further conversation with you. There's a big difference between what we're doing here and preserving this in perpetuity and, um, and looking at active fields for ball because fields. Because you can such. preserve it by leaving the deed open. I'm not yeah. saying you need to buy this land and immediately build pickleball courts. What I'm asking you is just leave the deed open, keep it, preserve it for your whatever thing you guys wanted to do. And when, when the town grows in 10 or 20 years, we're not going to be locked in without land because what you're going to do is you're going to go back to Hilltop Park and you want to put that turf field in with the lights. That's not the appropriate place for it. Yep. And the only reason it happens is because you keep on buying land and locking yourself into these deeds. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mayor, if I could just uh, clarify for the council, the land actually is already preserved. This was, this specific. it's just privately owned, preserved, open space, but the, the, it was put into preservation quite some time ago and it is limited to passive recreation. So all that's really happening here is that private open space will now become publicly held if this goes through. Thank you. Any other public comment on this? Come, if, please come up to the table. Again, name and address and whatever it is you have to say. Hi. Um, Wendy Maker, 459 Cherry Hill Road. Um, I guess I'm speaking in my capacity as uh, president of Friends of Princeton Open Space. I'm very excited to see this gift uh, to the town of private open space um, finally come to fruition. It's been a process of about eight or nine years now, I think, and I really appreciate the efforts of everybody who's worked to overcome various obstacles. Um, as Trishka said, um, this land was preserved as private open space for passive re recreation. Um, it's um, got a lot of wetlands, a lot of big trees, it's a very beautiful tract and it's going to be a lovely asset um, for the community. Um, so thank you very much and I encourage you to uh, vote yes on the rest of the uh, ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on this? All right, seeing none, I'm going to close the hearing and ask for a roll call vote. Ms. Perone Lambros? Yes. Ms. Niedergang? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. Mr. Newland? Yes. Thank you. Next up is Ordinance 2023 04. 
an ordinance by the municipality of Princeton extending refuge collection hours and amending the code of the borough of Princeton, New Jersey, 1974. Is there a motion on this? So I wanted to make a motion to table this for 30 days. Is that the correct way to go about doing it? <clears throat> Actually, what you would be doing is Extent. postponing the public hearing Postpone. and okay. uh, we'll just need an actual date. So uh, a month from now is actual March 13th. Is, is, is actually Whatever March 13th the next is council, the, is the council, council meeting of which you would be holding the public hearing. You want to just yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. March 13th. March is 13th. It. Yeah. yeah. So I'll make a motion then to postpone this hearing until March 13th, 2023. Okay. Is there a second? Um, Leighton, is that a second or a question? Second. second. Okay. And I think we should just. Is, okay. Go ahead. Can Can I ask a question at this? point? Point is this You're probably going to ask the question I was about to address, but go ahead. Oh, okay. So, so what happens if we want to make changes in the current ordinance? Then, instead of rehearing it, do we then vote it down and reintroduce it? Or no, you would just introduce the amendments. Oh, you could. It, then, okay. Yeah, and you then you the just next ordinance? have a hearing and on the ordinance as amended. Yeah. But wouldn't it be substantially different, possibly? Well, but that's the whole point. I mean, if you're going to make changes, you know, substantial changes to the ordinance, then what you do is you basically you intro you reintroduce the amendments. You give notice of the amendments. You continue to carry the public hearing so people can comment on the amendments. Right. Now I understand perfectly. Thank you. So reintroduction is a bit of a misnomer, but it's less of a mouthful. All right, and I was just going to add that the, I believe the reason to extend the public hearing date is to allow more input from the public. There were some concerns raised about the times on. Well, yeah, on and there's, the there's more work to be done because the, yep. the, um, the community, the uh, steering committee of the um, special improvement district is, uh, not, is not here present to give their presentation yep. or to do the work, so. No, I always think it's good to get a plug in that we're listening yep. to the public and trying not to move things without full participation and knowledge. Okay, so we have a motion to extend this to March 13th. It's been seconded. Roll call vote. Ms. Perone Lambros? Yes. Ms. Niedergang? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. Mr. Newland? Yes. Thank you. Next up is Ordinance 2023-05, an ordinance by the Municipality of Princeton concerning solid waste and recycling and amending Chapter 15 of the Code of the Borough of Princeton, New Jersey, 1974. And based on the action we just took in this ordinance, Section 15-36B and 15-36B1 uh, would have each would have one item changed where the 6 a.m. would be changed to 7 a.m. So I just want to make sure we're all, we're all clear on that. So we have a motion on that. Thank you, Eve. Is there a second? Thank you, David. Okay. Uh, I also have a very minor amendment that I would like to suggest. Sure. Um, this is to section 15-3.5E which states that um, when a resident moves, um, excess solid waste carts will be collected by the municipality. And I just think it was a little unclear to me as I read it, and I wanted to add the word um, collecting excess municipal solid waste carts, if any, from the households. So. Uh, it just clarifies we're not collecting all excess solid waste <laughs> carts that may happen to be on any property that gets um, sold. Okay, so that changes specifically to the last phase, a uh, last phrase on the last sentence. Yeah. Okay. Trish, are you comfortable yeah, with that? Yeah, so 15-3.5E we're inserting the word municipal in front of yes. excess solid or excess municipal solid waste cards. Correct. Yep. Got it. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So we have a motion, we have a second with three amendments to how it is now written in the agenda package. Any other questions or comments up here? 
Any public comment? All right, seeing none, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Perone Lambros? Yes. Ms. Niedergang? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. Mr. Newland? Yes. Thank you. Ordinance introductions, we have three of them. Ordinance 2023-06, an ordinance by the Mayor and Council of Princeton concerning salaries and compensation of certain personnel of the Municipality of Princeton. Public hearing, February 27th, 2023. Is there a motion? Thank you, David. Eve's got the second. Roll call vote. Ms. Perone Lambros? Yes. Ms. Niedergang? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. Mr. Newland? Yes. And just to remind everybody, these are simply introductions and any discussion takes place at the public hearings. Next up is Ordinance 2023-07, Bond Ordinance Amending Bond Ordinance Number 2021-21 of Princeton in the County of Mercer, New Jersey. Finally adopted July 12th, 2021 in order to amend the description of the project. Public hearing February 27th, 2023. Is there a motion? Thank you, Michelle. Is there a second? Thank you, David. Roll call. Ms. Perone Lambros? Yes. Ms. Niedergang? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. Mr. Newland? Yes. Thank you. Ordinance 2023-08, an ordinance of the Municipality of Princeton authorizing the acquisition of certain real property located at 1-10 Franklin Avenue designated as Block 21.04, Lot 2 on the tax map of the Municipality of Princeton. Public hearing February 27th, 2023. Is there a motion? Leticia has got the motion. Mia has got the second. Roll call vote. I'm sorry. Who had the second? Mia had the second. Okay. Ms. Perone Lambros? Yes. Ms. Niedergang? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. Mr. Nolan? Yes. Thank you. Resolutions. 23-68, Resolution of the Mayor and Council of Princeton supporting an application by Friends of Princeton Open Space, space for Green Acres Stewardship Matching Grant and committing to in-kind services for two years. Is there a, Mia's got the motion, Michelle's got the second. Questions or comments? All right, seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And I do go. have a comment, I just wanted to thank Wendy Mager, and for all her work on behalf of Open Space in Princeton. Yeah, thank you, Wendy, so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you, Wendy. Okay. 2369 resolution of the Mayor and Council of Princeton approving appraisal report and authorizing an agreement for the acquisition of certain real property located at 1 10 Franklin Avenue, designated as Lot 2 in Block 21.04 on the tax map of the municipality. Of Princeton. Is there a motion? Leighton's got the motion. I'm sorry. Wait. I was just pointing out Michelle had had her hand raised. Michelle was the quickest? <laughs> okay, Michelle gets the motion. Leighton gets the second. And I'm just going to point out that the dollar value there is $1,720,000, uh, which is kind of an important detail to note. All right, any questions or comments? All right, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, the next resolution, number three, 2370, was removed from the agenda for tonight. After that, 2371, resolution of the Mayor and Council of Princeton authorizing the award of a construction contract to S. Brothers, Inc. in the not-to-exceed amount of $4,302,771.18 for the Witherspoon Street Phase Two Roadway Improvements Project. Is there a motion? Michelle's got the motion. Eve's got the second. Questions, comments? Just a comment. I just I want to thank our uh, uh, Jim and, and Deanna, our engineering staff. Um, it's really tricky uh, trying to get the earmark funding as well, um, but we're working on um, getting some additional funding, but we do have the, the grant from the state that we need to, um, to move expeditiously on. So we're moving forward and we're, we're working together with um, Congresswoman uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman's office to um, to find a solution for the uh, other $750,000 that's been earmarked. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 
23-72, resolution of the Mayor and Council of Princeton authorizing a professional services agreement with T&M Associates in the not to exceed amount of $379,464 for Witherspoon Street Phase 3 design services. Is there, Leighton's got the motion, Michelle's got the second. Questions or comments? See none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 23-73. Resolution of the Mayor and Council of Princeton authorizing the award of a professional engineering and planning services agreement to Michael Baker International Inc. for a cost not to exceed $140,000 for the Harrison Street Quarter study. Is there, David had the motion, he's got the second. Questions, comments? I have a comment. I just want to say I'm really excited about seeing this. Um, it's amazing how, how many projects are moving forward, but after tonight's uh, presentation with the two-lane bike lane, it, let's let's see what let's see what the university can do to help us in, in terms of um, putting in some bike lanes there. So thank you. Okay. Harrison Street is easy. <laughs> yeah, that is a little wider. The one the one street in town that's easy. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 2374, resolution of the Mayor and Council of Princeton authorizing a professional services agreement with Dakotas Fitzpatrick Cole and Giblin LLP in an amount not to exceed $25,000 for professional legal services, conflict council, redevelopment council, and special projects. Is there a motion? I'm, gonna, I'm going down this side, sorry. I'm getting uh, Leighton on the motion and Leticia on the second. Any questions or comments? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 2375, resolution of the Mayor and Council of Princeton authorizing the purchase of police vehicles not to exceed the amount of $325,000. Is there a motion? Leticia's got the motion, David's got the second. I'm sure you all read it in the package, but just so it's on the record, no police vehicles, as the captain mentioned, were able to be purchased in 2021 and 2022 because the window to purchase the vehicles opened and closed so quickly. And actually $121,650 of this money had been approved in 2022. And so we're hoping to make the window this year and get the hybrid police vehicles. <laughs> hybrid, just mentioning that. That's Questions, right. comments? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that this is a little bit unorthodox compared to what we're used to when we approve vehicle purchases. People notice there is no specific number of vehicles that is approved. And the reason for that is that the pricing has also been, in addition to the ordering windows, the pricing has really been a moving target. And so we sort of need to approve the money in advance of knowing how many cars we'll be able to get for the money. So that's why the number is, uh, is not in there in case people are um, curious. Yep. Any other comments or questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 2376, resolution of the Mayor and Council of Princeton authorizing the purchase of the New Jersey Al um, Alco Test 9510 evidential brother breath, geez, test system at a not to exceed cost of $19,305. Eve, you have the motion? Thank you very much. Is there a second? Leticia's got the second. Questions or comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 2377, resolution of the Mayor and Council of Princeton authorizing the execu execution of a final extension of a use and occupancy Mayor. agreement with Princeton First Aid and Rescue Mayor. School. Uh, yes. Yep, yep, yep. I need uh, you to recuse that. yourself. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I wasn't, the I didn't read ahead. <laughs> no, but that meant like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You including reading the resolution. Okay. All right. Okay, so. Uh, 2377, resolution of the mayor and council authorizing the execution of a final extension of a use and occupancy agreement with the per Princeton First Aid and Rescue Squad, PFARS for 14 Clearview Avenue. Do we have a motion? David, second, Michelle, any questions, um, comments? Just a comment that, you know, we, we said this will be a final extension, um, you know, with the hopes that we will. Um, come to some agreement with what we want to do with that particular piece of property um, in the very, very near future. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any aye. abstentions? I'm going to abstain. And I, I must clarify only, not that I don't value and support our first responders, I just because I had understood that the last extension was going to be the last extension, so 
That's the only reason. Okay. And any nays? Okay. Thank you very much. The consent agenda is next, but just to check that everyone's good, no one has anything they want pulled off the consent agenda before we move that in block. All right, would someone move the consent agenda? Thank you, Eve. Is there a second? Leighton, thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, David, do you have a motion? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I move that we adjourn. Thank you. Is there a second? Yes, sir. Second. There is. Thank you very much, Eve. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank aye. you all for being here this evening. Have a good night. Every now and then. You gotta like those. <laughs> well, if we could get out. <laughs> we just gotta get in the hat. Oh, okay. Okay.